at the end of the first part of this lecture on chapters 11 and 12 in seminar 19, we read from page 134 of the book about this one that is not there for the analyst as real, this one that is not there. And we returned to illustrate this with that simple math. What is this one that is not there in analysis, this jouissance that is not there in analysis? Well, you know it's sexual jouissance, impossible jouissance, unconscious jouissance, real jouissance, the list goes on. The zero here also designates the empty set. This is the number that we use to mark the place as well as the operational logic, you heard me say of this one that is not there, which brings us again to that basic math. When you subtract one from itself, there is a one that is no longer there, and yet a one about which we can still speak, a one that we can mark in all of its absence with zero. Phi minus phi equals obja is like one minus one equals zero. Now that's review in more ways than one. I want to ask though, in the spirit of this two-part lecture on chapters 11 and 12 in seminar 19, another question. Where do we locate the subject, the classic neurotic Lacanian subject in all of this? The subject in this formula that we're working with, zero pointing to one and parens pointing to another one, recall this from the end of chapter 12, is a oneification of this zero point, this empty set, but strictly in the sense of containment. The subject is a setification. You heard me in the last lecture refer to it as a vessel of lack, a container of lack. This is what we are edging towards here. The zero that points to one in parentheses suggests that the one of the subject is a one that contains the zero that conditioned its production. The subject is here figured as a set strictly in the sense of containment. What the subject does is it setifies lack. It contains lack. It oneifies that zero that marks lack. The subject, in other words, is a site and structure, the vessel in which the zero of sexual, impossible, unconscious and real jouissance is made to count as one. When Lacan starts messing with the NAD, remember this? Chapters 11, chapters 12, a little bit before that too. And with this image of a bag with a hole in it that you heard me refer to a couple lectures ago, it's the subject, specifically the split subject in analysis that he has in mind. The nad, the bag with the hole in it, the one made of the zero point of lack, this is the barred neurotic subject for Lacan. And this, again, is also what the one in parentheses on page 154 of seminar 19, with this zero pointing to one in parentheses, this is what it means. And you can guess what the one outside this parentheses on page 154 designates. Here is the illusory number one with which the master begins his self-aggrandizing count. Heedless of the truth of castration that conditions his ability to speak and repeatedly declare his oneness. So if you wanna start putting all of this stuff together, zero pointing to one in parentheses, that zero is the experience of lack that results from castrative logic. And the subject is the structure or the vessel that emerges around this lack, carrying it with it the way a vessel carries something with it. And this is all in parentheses because the other one, the one to which this parentheses points, 
the one that inaugurates the naive count of the master, forgets all that shit, pretends it's not there. That naive count of the master saying, there is oneness and I am it, it presupposes the inaccessibility, the forgetting, the slipping into oblivion of this process from loss to lack to desirous subjectivity. That's why, again, in the Discourse of the Master, you see that barred subject in the position of truth, unconscious truth, the truth that the Master can't bear. That's what's in parentheses here. And Lacan is just trying to remind us of all of the maneuvering that happens in order for someone to rise up and cry, there is oneness and I am it. Prior to this, there is barred subjectivity. Prior to this, there is an experience of lack. Prior to this, there is an experience of loss. Prior to, you see, you don't even have to think about it chronologically. You can just throw them all out on the table. Lacan's point is, look at how many different operations are occurring and conditioning as a result the ability to just speak. And in this case, to pronounce oneness for and as oneself. But let's stay focused here. Let's stay focused on the subject for just a minute longer. This bag with a hole in it, this vessel in which nothing is made to count as something. If zero marks the empty set, how do we designate the turning of this zero into one at the level of the subject? In other words, on page 154, what does that first arrow designate? What type of an operation is occurring there? In set theory, the subject, we would say, is a set with two elements. The empty set, qua lack, qua whole, and the subject, qua formation, qua container, qua bag. I'm going to see how many times I can say qua here. Actually, what I'm going to do instead is draw this out just so you can see it. If you're watching, what I'm holding up right now is that zero point, an empty set. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to contain that empty set in a broader set such that it is one element, but not the only element. It's now a zero comma one inside the brackets that we know so well in set theory. This is the subject zero comma one in brackets, the subject as a set, as a container. Here is your bag and there is your hole in it. One designates the container, zero designates the thing contained. If you want to start like teasing this out, you don't need to be precise. This is one thing you can learn from Lacan's mathematics. You don't actually need to be a precise mathematician in order to get what Lacan is trying to say here. So don't worry about whether we've got it all precisely right and all this kind of shit. The subject is a bag with a hole in it, and Lacan is doing his damnedest to put this on sound mathematical footing. That's what he's up to with the empty set and with its containment in another set here with another element, this element, one. Hence, again, the added import of that fifth vector that he also adds to this conversation in his revised topology of discourse. Notably in the analytic discourse, where that fifth vector again allows an S2 to condition a barred subject to condition a symptomatic expression. Check this out. From S2 to the barred subject in the discourse of the analyst, from the lower left-hand quadrant of truth to the upper right-hand quadrant of other, of knowledge, in this case of they who speak in analysis, the barred subject. This fifth vector from S2 to barred subject, this is what we're talking about here. And Lacan is trying to tell us what this fifth vector means. You want to know what that arrow is between 0 and 1 in parentheses on page 154? It's the fifth vector in a sense. It's about how nothing becomes something, a figure of lack around which the barred subject takes shape. 
in the position of S2 of the analyst, I'm sorry, the analyzan's unconscious truth, right alongside the analyst's knowledge of the unconscious. Here we find everything that you would expect. In the position of S2, relative to the analyzan, you again see the sexual, the impossible, the real things we've been discussing the past few series. And all as such, and this is the key point, missing, lacking, absent, and again, as Lacan puts it here in Seminar 19, inaccessible. Inaccessible to who? Inaccessible to all who would deny the basic fact of human life, at least as far as neurotics are concerned, barred subjectivity. Only as a whole, in a bag, can this be accessed. Only as a whole in a bag can the sexual, the impossible, and the real be accessed. It's there, to be sure, but it can only be accessed in and through the bag that it is not. That's the thing about holes in bags. You got a hole in a bag, huh? Remove the bag and now show me where the hole is. You see? You need the bag in order to designate the hole. No bag, no hole to see. Or if you're a Heideggerian, no vase, no emptiness to observe. So it is with the real. At some level, all this amounts to is what Lacan tells us on page 122 of Seminar 19 in a really clear statement of what he means by the real. I get so many emails from people who want to know about the real. Tell me about the real. What's going on with the real? It's really not that complicated for Lacan, and he's trying to spell it out for folks. Check out page 122 in the passage that we've reviewed in our previous lectures. It's a great answer to the question of how he understands the real at this point in his thought. The real, as Lacan plainly states, works as follows. We only have access to it in and through impossibilities defined by the symbolic. The real is only accessible via impossibilities that are defined by the symbolic, which is why I've always referred to them as statements of impossibility, pronouncements, names of the real. It's in the field of the symbolic when symbols start to founder that we see the real, that we can access the real. If it shows up, the parts of it that do show up, they always show up in the symbolic as statements of impossibility. That's what he's getting at at the top of page 122. It's a great passage, very clear. You should check it out. Back to the work at hand. And with another question. What becomes of lack when the subject takes shape around it as this oneification of the one that isn't there? Well, lack, when the subject takes shape around it, is reiterated, reproduced, in short, repeated. And think back to our lectures on repetition coming out of seminars 16, 17, and forward. Lacan's theory of repetition holds here. There's the thing repeated and the act of repetition. The act of repetition at a later date that retro effects as its origin, the thing repeated. We've been over all this, but it is at work here. Lacan is assuming that everybody has this under their belts, as he says, that lack is reiterated, reproduced, and repeated in the figure of the subject as a vessel, as a container, as a set. And I think that's exactly what you see in the transition from the empty set to its inclusion in a set with one other element that I just drew. And I'm holding up again now so you can see. That is the zero pointing to a one in parentheses on page 154. I think that's a good way to read this, even at the risk of blurring some important distinctions, subtle distinctions, distinctions that I don't think get in the way of understanding what Lacan is up to here. And that is our goal, clear, coherent, and accessible understandings of what Lacan is up to.
at this, at this point in seminar 19. All of which is to say, to remind you, really, of the following. The subject who originates from the unconscious also reproduces it, carrying it with them wherever they go from one experience to the next. You see, at some level, we're just talking about basic psychoanalytic theory here. The subject originates from an unconscious that it carries with it wherever they go, from there on out, from one experience to the next. When Lacan introduces the NAD at the end of chapter 10 in seminar 19, saying that it precedes the monad, that's really what's at stake there. Before the one, the monad that you see in the discourse of the master, there's the NAD. That's what he's trying to do. Before the monad, there was the NAD. When he introduces the NAD, saying that it precedes the monad, it's the subject, it's the neurotic subject, the barred desirous subject, as effected by and encompassing of lack that he has in mind. This one made of zero as the effect of lack, as Lacan puts it on page 138 of seminar 19, is the first number in any count prior to any masterful count of one, two, and three. A complex, multifaceted one that precedes the master's simplistic, illusory claims of singularity. That's why on page 154, you see the zero pointing to one in parentheses and then another one outside the parentheses with an arrow pointed to it. Lacan is here saying there's a one before the one. The one before the one that is the masterful statement of autonomy is the one of barred subjectivity. The nad that precedes the master's monad. Let me be clear, because as soon as we start mashing up these ones, I know it gets a little tangled. So let's try and be precise with this. Because it is a one made of zero, a bag with a hole in it, the subject looks nothing like the S1 of mastery, and even less like the exceptional one that props up masculine fantasies of the phallic function negated, of non-castration. The only one that resembles any of these in the barred subject is the slash itself. But notice that motherfucker's on a tilt. This is not the vertical slash in a dollar sign. The subject is slashed by the same slash that produces the empty set when you strike it through a zero or an O. My point is this. Before any of these whole ones in the form of exceptional men, real men, masters, and the like, all of which are delusional as hell, there was this hold one, divided one, this shot through one, this one that emerges from and around a zero point of lack. Before the whole one, that men qua masters like to fantasize about. There was this one with holes in it, divided, split, multiple. Why? Because structured around a point of lack. Lacan's pretty good about this in these chapters. I feel like he is coming to terms with some things that in his earlier thought are more elusive more difficult to track down. He's just speaking them very directly here in Seminar 19, which I really appreciate. Page 141 gives us another great passage where you got a bunch of ones strung together, but I think in light of what you heard, it makes a little more sense. Toward the bottom of page 141, Lacan begins, the sequence of integers is supported by nothing other than the reiteration of the one the one that came out of the empty set. 
So the master's sequence of integers, one begetting two, begetting three, and so forth, is supported by nothing other than the reiteration of the one as barred subject, the one that came out of the empty set, namely lack. It is in reproducing that it constitutes what I gave last time as the principle displayed in Pascal's triangle at the level of the cardinality of the monads. Behind the supports, I'm saying this for the deaf ones who have been wondering what I said. You have what I call the nad. That is to say, the one that has come out of the empty set, which is the reiteration of lack. This is the barred subject. It's the nad that reiterates lack, encompassing it, being at once its product and its vessel. I stress, Lacan continues, that the one at issue is specifically what set theory replaces only with the reiteration of the empty set, whereby this theory shows the true nature of the NAD. And that's what we're trying to work up here with set theory. They're trying to show the subject as a bag with a hole in it. Now, if you're able to think a bag with a hole in it, you've got everything that Lacan is trying to tell you about this NAD before the monad, this oneification of zero, this encompassment of lack. I don't want to end there, though, because on 142, you get some other good shit. We got to keep this book open for a minute longer. When it comes to what is involved in the empty set, Lakoff continues, it is affirmed as a founding principle of set theory that it can only be one. This one, the NAD, that is the principle behind the emergence of the numerical one. So the NAD is the barred subject behind the principle of the emergence of the S1 that we know as the master's discourse, that's what's happening here. The S1 in the discourse of the master is a monad. It's a monadology, if you really want to fuck with it. The truth that conditions, that is the cause of that effect, is the nad, is the barred subject in the position of truth in the discourse of the master. When it comes to what is involved in the empty set, hear it again. It is affirmed as a founding principle of set theory that it can only be one. This one, this nad, that is the principle behind the emergence of the numerical one, the masterful one, that S1, of the one from which an integer is made, like an integer in the naive count one, two, three, is thus something that is posited as lying at the origin of the empty set itself. This notion is important because we are examining this structure to the extent that for us in the analytic discourse, the one suggests itself as the principle behind repetition. There's that magic word from the late 1960s again. Therefore, it is a matter here precisely of the sort of one that finds itself marked out as never being anything but a lack, an empty set. I looked up NAD. Maybe you looked up NAD too. Monad, what the fuck's a NAD got to do with the mono, with the one? Where does NAD come from? Let me tell you, I didn't find out much about this shit. The etymology of NAD, N-A-D, I found it rather elusive, surprisingly elusive. But one potential source of the term I found useful here, the NAD as not plus had. The NAD is what is not had. And maybe this is what Lacan is getting at when he says it descends from Spanish. Maybe what he has in mind is the nad in nada. In any case, 
Here's what we can say. The NAD of split subjectivity that precedes the monadology that is the master's discourse is precisely what must remain suppressed, displaced, and inaccessible in order for the master to sound off, there is one and I am it. But again, enough about these idiotic ones sounding off. Let's stick with the nad here, exactly as Lacan invites us to do by repeatedly returning to this figure of the nad. What becomes of it? What becomes of this nad, this one comprised of zero, this bag with a hole in it, the subject of lack in analytic experience? Again, you already know the answer to this question, like every question that has been asked in this two-part series on chapters 11 and 12 in Seminar 15. The analyzand effected by the unconscious as seen in the fifth vector in Lacan's revised discursive typology in Seminar 19, is the cause of yet another unconscious effect, namely the symptom. In the discourse of the analyst, you see an arrow from S2 to Bard's subject and from Bard's subject down to symptom. That's what we're talking about here. The analyzand is an effect of the unconscious, but the symptom is an effect of this earlier effect. It is an effect of the subject, of the analyzand. From unconscious truths to barred subjects to symptomatic expressions, S2 to barred S to S1, it's lack repeating all the way down, my friends. But always, as with Lacan, a repetition with a difference again and again in the form and the function of what we might call refiguration instead of repetition. The subject refigures the unconscious, and the symptom, assuming your analysis is worth a shit, promises to refigure the subject. But hold up, before I start wondering whether your analysis is worth a shit, let's slow down a minute and take this one step at a time. Recall what you already know about the symptom at this point in Lacan's thought. Again, more review. The symptom is the part of the analyzand's unconscious that can be said. And it always says the same thing, as I hope you know by now. There's more to all of this than can be said, the symptom proclaims. Beyond this point, I, the symptom, am powerless to proceed further. Beyond this statement of weakness, incapacity, impotentiality, in short, castration, that I am, the symptom says, I can speak no further. Yet another reason, I believe, why there's no vector between S2 and S1 in the analytic discourse if S1 as symptom is the part of one's unconscious truth that can be said, S2 is the part of one's unconscious truth that cannot be said, the part which, relative to the world of speech, remains missing, lacking, absent, zeroed out, not. This is the one that is not in analysis, and yet precisely the one to be analyzed up to a point as I imagine the conclusion to this second lecture. All via the barred subject. Again, S2 pointing to the barred subject down to S1 in the discourse of the analyst. The barbed subject is the medium between the unconscious and the symptom. Notice how Lacan presents this sequence of refigurations from the zero of unconscious truth to the one of barred subjectivity to the subsequent one of the symptom, qua S1. So remember, we've got these two different S1s. I think you know pretty clearly what the S1 is in the discourse of the master. Here we are arriving at the other S1, the flip side, the inverse of the master's one, the S1 that is the symptom in the discourse of the analyst. That's what we're working up here. From naught 
to nad to monad, if you want to put it a little differently. So think about this. The zero of unconscious truth, there's your not. To the one of barred subjectivity, there's your nad. To the subsequent one of the symptom, here is a totally different monadology. From not to nad to monad, S2 to barred subject to S1. This is what Lacan is attempting to show his audience. Turn, for instance, to pages 144 to 145. I think this stuff is fabulous. It's right here at the end of chapter 11. Analytic theory, he begins at the bottom of page 144, sees the one rearing its head at two of its levels. So he's at the end of a lesson, and he's trying to really boil this down to two levels, two innumerable ways that the one is figuring. He says, in analytic theory, we see the one at two different levels. Here's the first level. At the first level, the one is the one that repeats. It lies at the foundation of this major incidence in the analyzant's speaking, which he decries as a certain repetition with regard to, the sign to a signifying structure. This is about the production of the barred subject from unconscious truth. This is about the fifth vector from S2 to the barred subject in the discourse of the analyst. And again, I want to emphasize this again. In order to do this work, listening to these lectures and reading the book is not enough. You got to have pencil and paper as well. Whenever I say discourse of the analyst, you should be able to envision that thing. And if you can't envision the discourse of the analyst, write it down with little a pointed to barred subject and then an arrow down to the production of symptoms as S1. You see what I'm saying? Have the topology in front of you. This thing is easier to understand with your eyes than it oftentimes is with your ears. The first level in question, the first one in analysis, is that from S2 to barred subject, the production of the NAD of the subject as a bag with a hole in it. Which brings us to the second. On the other hand, Lacan continues, considering the diagram that I have provided for the analytic discourse, see, he's also noting this, have this diagram in front of you, and it'll be much easier to make sense of what's being said. On the other hand, considering the diagram that I have provided for the analytic discourse, what is produced, so we're talking about production, when the subject is placed at the level of the jouissance of speaking, what is produced and which I have designated at the story of surplus jouissance is S1. So here he's referring to the lower right-hand quadrant of the discourse of the analyst. At the level of surplus enjoyment, what is produced in analysis is a symptom. And that becomes the turning point, I believe. I don't know that Lacan is on top of it yet, but I believe that there is a latent turning point here. In other words, what happens when you take very seriously the figure and the function of the symptom as an object of surplus enjoyment? Think everything you know about surplus enjoyment and then ask yourself, what happens when your own symptoms become objects for surplus enjoyment, almost like any other commodity that you might enjoy in a similar way. It's a very interesting connection. At the story of surplus jouissance, there is an S1, Lacan here says. This is the second one that you see popping in analysis, the beginning of what I have referred to just a moment ago as a wildly different monadology. And yet, as we're about to see, one that ultimately slips back into the dilemma of mastery. Hang tight, we'll get there. It'll be worth it. This, Lacan continues, is a signifying production. 
that I propose to acknowledge, even if it means setting myself the task of giving you a sense of its incidence. But in what exactly? Pop down a few more lines on page 145, and Lacan gives you the answer, S1 as a type of monad. The one at issue in this S1, which the subject produces an ideal point, let's say, in analysis, is contrary to what is at issue in repetition. The one as one by itself, it is the one in as much as whatever difference might exist, all differences are worth as much as another. There is only one of them, and this is difference per se. Now he wants to end lesson number 11 in seminar 19 with a bang. This is the bang on which he ends. For our purposes, what matters is his ability and his interest in tracing out at two levels these productions of oneness. The first one in question is the NAD, is the barred subject. From S2 to barred S, this is a one produced from the unconscious. This is the bag with the hole in it. This is the one that you are, and me as well, if we're lucky. There is, however, another one that you see in the discourse of the analyst at the level of that S1. The symptom is another one that is coughed up and produced by the NAD. It's a monadology extending from the NAD that the barred subject is. And with this, at long last, we arrive at another approach to that second number one in the mathematical logic that Lacan presents on page 154. Remember, you've got a zero pointing to a one in parentheses. I think we're pretty clear at this point on what that shows us. The zero is the S2 pointing to the one of barred subjectivity. And by S2, I mean unconscious truth. And by unconscious truth, I mean all the effects of promotion, prohibition, loss, and lack that we call castration, feeding right into the production of an unconscious that only appears as a space of lack for reasons that I think are pretty obvious. The one that is pointed to from this zero in parentheses is the subject comprised of this lack the subject effected by the unconscious, and the vessel that carries this unconscious wherever it goes. That's our first one. And now, with the S1 of the symptom, you get another approach to the second one that appears on page 154. The parens points to yet another one. This is the one of the symptom. So if you want to write it out, zero here equals S2. The first one equals barred subject, and the second one in the discourse of the analyst is the symptom. I believe that it's here, at the end of this sequence with the second one, that we get a great reminder. It's there, I believe, to remind us of what the master, and if you want to read this as the masculine subject, have at it all too often forgets. Here it is again. Oneness, singularity, autonomy. All of these are effects, productions, operational results of more original, foundational states of multiplicity, heteronomy, and subjectification. And like all origins, this origin of multiplicity that props up any claim of oneness. These are complex origins. Before the one which the master begins is a one minus one yielding zero refigured as one refigured as one at the start of a wildly different sequence of integers. This shit is complex. What we've done though is taken it one step at a time. 
and always in Lacanian terms. Here is that sequence again in Lacanian terms. Phi minus phi yields OJ A as the mark of lack around which the original one, the desirous subject, is structured. Only to then give way to another one, the one of the symptom, an S1. Unlike anyone, the master can wrap his head or his heart around. Now, this is a recording, so you can pause, you can back up, and you can read those two complex statements of origin. But it's what this amounts to. Lacan is again and again returning to the original multiplicity of complex subject formations that allows for statements like, there is oneness and I am it. And thus, to bring this nearer to an end, I think we're left with two paths forward. One of which, as I hope you're beginning to sense, is more fruitful than the other, and each with its own S1. And you get to pick. Choose your own adventure. Which S1 do you want? Do you want the S1 of masterful delusions of grandeur in the field of phallic enjoyment? Or that of barred subjectivity en route to elsewhere by way of the symptom? Now, it's not that easy if you choose the latter, as we're going to see. But it's a hell of a better place to begin than with that of the masterful delusion of grandeur so typical of subjects in the field of phallic enjoyment. If your S1, nevertheless, is that of the master signifier, and it's okay, go to the mirror, look at it, and say, oh shit, yep, that's me. If this is your S1, the signifier of mastery, that says there is oneness and I am it, if you're that guy, it ain't the end of the world, but it does mean some trouble. Trouble in the form of ignorance, exploitation, endless consumerism, fleeting enjoyments. That is indeed what surplus enjoyment is. It's a crumb of jouissance, which barely fills a belly. Loneliness and lovelessness in every touch. And all why? Just so you can convince yourself that someday, some way, you might have what it takes to be a real man who enjoys without constraint in uncastrated form exactly as you say you do with every master signifier that you hurl at everyone around you. Analysis is good because it helps you past all this bullshit. Again, assuming yours is worth a shit. However, what if you choose the second path? What if you choose an S1, that of your own symptom, your own symptom? I think you're much better off, at least for the time being. Let me explain. And again, with a question whose answer I think you already know. What becomes of barred subjects who at the behest of unconscious truths beyond their reach cough up symptoms, much as the shattered mast of a sunken ship washes up on your beach in pieces? Ideally, they don't see their symptoms as litter, trash, and detritus of spoken discourse, but instead as enigmatic treasures, or, put a bit more archly, real finds. And you know what follows finds of this sort, the hystericization of the analysand. Where the master's discourse was, that of the hysteric becomes, again, assuming your analysis, dear neurotic, 
is worth a shit. I told you there are four stages toward extraphallic enjoyment. That's where all of this began. The same extraphallic enjoyment Lacan affords to feminine subjects, if we can just cut to the chase here. The discourse of the hysteric, I would like to suggest, marks a third stage in this development, and arguably the most precarious stage. Stage one, in the development of a capacity to enjoy beyond the phallic function, but without negating it, in which not all of your enjoyments are governed by the phallic function, was the discourse of the master. Stage two was the discourse of the analyst. And stage three, I'm now offering as the discourse of the hysteric. Recall how it looks, the standard topology of the discourse of the hysteric. And you've got your pen and you've got your paper, and so you can write it down. The barred subject addressing S1 in the position of the other, producing as an effect of this address S2, which is then an object of surplus enjoyment for the barred subject. Meanwhile, in the position of truth, bottom left-hand quadrant, you see object A. This is the standard topology of the discourse of the hysteric. Note, I'm not introducing the fifth vector yet. In lectures on Lacan, as you know, we've read this topology several different ways. For instance, as a blueprint of social protest, as a way of playing hard to get. That's another common way to read the discourse of the hysteric. And of course, we've read it in terms of analytic experience as well. It's this latter reading of the discourse of the hysteric as an outgrowth of that of the analyst that concerns us here in chapters 11 and 12 of Seminar 19. To hystericize the neurotic subject and analysis, this nad, this bag with a hole in it, is to invite and embolden and even compel the neurotic subject to speak from the position of their barred subjectivity. The same barred subjectivity that at the behest of the unconscious just coughed up a symptom. The S1 in the analytic discourse, as well as the S1 in the discourse of the hysteric, they are both algebraic symbols of this symptom. So the S1 that is produced in the discourse of the analyst is the same S1 that is addressed, discussed, in that of the hysteric. They are both symptoms. In analytic and hysteric discourses alike, Hear it again. S1 equals a symptomatic expression. One shows it popping up and the other shows it being addressed. But note that the counterclockwise rotation must occur in order for the discourse of the hysteric to do this work. There's a counterclockwise rotation that emerges in the discourse of the analyst. You can look at the discourse of analysis and then shift each position counterclockwise, a quarter turn, if you will. And what you'll see is that the result of that counterclockwise turn is the production of the discourse of the hysteric. That's what is important to note here. Why? Because to hystericize the analyzand is to ask them to turn back the clock rewinding from symptom to subjectivity to the unconscious truth that commanded both and coming to terms with that shit. And that's exactly what you see in the discourse of the hysteric. The barred subject addresses their symptomatic expressions, forcing them to reveal, to disclose, to produce unconscious truths, here the S2, from which they originated. That's what the discourse of the hysteric shows. The barred subject addresses, grapples with their symptomatic expressions, pushing on them, prodding them, exploiting them even for their ability to produce a connection with an unconscious truth 
heretofore unknown and inaccessible. The same unconscious truth that caused this symptom to begin with. This dialectization, as we've called it, of symptomatic expression and unconscious truth of S1 and S2 in the discourse of the hysteric, I want to end by suggesting that this process of forcing S1s to produce unconscious truths, it becomes a source of enjoyment for the analyzand, inviting additional symptoms, additional inquiries, additional dialectizations of the unconscious again and again and again. Analyzands, when hystericized, learn to get off not only on their symptoms, but on their ability to exploit symptoms for the production of unconscious truth in the form of self-knowledge. That is where we are headed. The symptom that once ground associations to a halt, causing the analyzan to founder on their own enigmatic speech, it now becomes the opposite, not seized speech, but endless speech, the cause for endless deciphering. Although certainly productive, certainly more productive than just writing out the discourse of the master, this process, I would like to conclude by suggesting, is also precarious as hell. Let me tell you what I mean by this. The dialectizations of symptomatic speech and unconscious truth are productive for psychoanalyses. There's no denying this. It almost goes without saying. This is good work when you are pressing on your symptoms and connecting them to fields of discourse of which you're comprised but you know nothing about, pushing from symptom into the unconscious truth that commanded you to cough it up in the first place. This is good work. Don't get it twisted. Yet another reason to recall the other side of psychoanalysis, the discourse of the master, however. If the discourse of the hysteric marks a quarter turn back from that of the analyst, notice this discourse of the hysteric that I'm saying is indeed a productive development in analysis. It's well captured by the fact that the discourse of the hysteric marks a quarter turn forward in that of the master with all four terms shifting clockwise. So in analysis, the analyzant, when hystericized, is asked to turn back the clock and inquire after the unconscious truths that produced them as a subject that they've been carrying with them all these years and then resulting in the expression of a symptom. In analysis, the analyzant is asked to dig back in to that process and as such, it's not a surprise that when you take the discourse of the analyst and you give it a quarter turn backward, counterclockwise, back in time, you get the discourse of the hysteric. Here is the other side of that, however. Note the discourse of the hysteric is a progression from the discourse of the master. Give the master's discourse a quarter turn and you have the production of the hysteric. If the discourse of the hysteric does indeed mark a quarter turn back from that of the analyst, in other words, don't forget that it marks a quarter turn forward in that of the master, with all four terms shifting clockwise. The truth of barred subjectivity that the master could not bear to acknowledge is the very position from which the hystericized analyzant speaks. I hope that is clear at this point. And note, the sequence of integers, one, two, three, and so on, produced by each discourse, they also appear quite distinct. The master fancies himself the one from which everyone else descends, from two to three to four and so on. But the hysteric, you would say, embraces the fact that their oneness is structured around a zero point beyond their reach, itself an effect of castrative logics they can only dream about. And that's just it. They can only dream about them. 
Aren't these two motherfuckers distinct? These are not the ones from which everyone else descends, but a series of ones descended from everyone else. That is the S1. That is the symptom in the discourse of the analyst and the discourse of the hysteric. Yeah, it can be read as a master signifier, but only insofar as you read that as an effect of a certain descent. The master thinks they're the one from which everyone else descends. The hystericized analyzant from the discourse of the analyst to that of the hysteric accepts that if they are one, it is because they have descended from everyone else, society, begetting the unconscious, begetting a symptom, and along the way, a barred subject, little more than a bag to contain all of this. If indeed the discourse of the hysteric founded on a zero made to count as one, yields a sequence of integers, one, two, three, and so on. It's a sequence of S1s, S2s, S3s, symptom after symptom after symptom, resulting in dialectization of symptom and unconscious, one right after the other. Which brings me to that precarity I mentioned, the precarity of the hystericization of analytic experience. Yes, don't get me wrong, the hysteric eludes and undermines the master's obsessive attempt to dominate others, reducing every partner to a part that allows them to feel whole. But the hysterics endless dialectizations of S1 and S2, symptom and unconscious, it always verges on another form of mastery, not of others, but of oneself. And this is paramount. This is precarious. Let me be categorical here at the end of things. The analytic effort to know thyself is ultimately just another form of phallic enjoyment. That's what I'm saying here. Which is why it's so important to read the right-hand side of the discourse of the hysteric as Lacan does, another instance of that pole of jouissance. The pole of jouissance that has surplus enjoyment in the top and sur I'm sorry, phallic enjoyment in the top and surplus enjoyment at the bottom, this pole of jouissance is still applicable in the discourse of the hysteric. Think about that. S1 in the discourse of the hysteric becomes an enigmatic figure of knowledge to be prodded, poked, and ultimately exploited for its ability to produce bite-sized bits of unconscious truth for the surplus enjoyment of a desirous analyzand in search of self-knowledge. Boom, that is it. This is the danger of hystericized analysis, is that S1 becomes one more figure of knowledge, one more slave to be prodded, poked, and ultimately exploited for its ability to churn out at the level of the commodity these bite-sized crumbs of unconscious truth and all for the surplus enjoyment of that barred subject, that desirous analyzant, an analyzant in search of self-knowledge, not mastery of others, but mastery of themselves. And I think we can be even more precise here to really capture how this works. The master's love of the autonomous one he fancies himself to be ahead of everyone else, it becomes the hystericized analyzant's love of heteronymous, headless knowledge for and about themselves. Make no mistake, in the final analysis, and that is where we are headed, all of the hysterics enjoyment remains phallic. And this, above all, is the danger, but also thankfully the delusion 
of the hystericized analyzand. The belief that unconscious truth can be captured and consumed as self-knowledge. That's the danger, but also the delusion, because you know that shit ain't true. If the other side of analysis is mastery, that's why Seminar 17 is called the other side of psychoanalysis and why it focuses on the master, because mastery is the other side of analysis. Just take the discourse of the analyst that's one that's sitting in front of you and turn it upside down, and you'll see. What then is the other side of the discourse of the hysteric? Well, write down the discourse of the hysteric in all of its four-part glory and then just turn that motherfucker upside down. It's the university. The other side of hysteria is the university. You can turn that discourse upside down and see it for yourself. This is what's dangerous about the discourse of the hysteric. Yes, it has abandoned mastery of others, but in place of others, now we have itself as one to be mastered by capturing unconscious truth in the form of self-knowledge according to that old Delphic maxim that so many think is the pinnacle of psychoanalytic theory, know thyself. Now, before we get too carried away, let me conclude with a few remarks. Up to this point in Lacan's thought, the end of analysis has turned on the positionality of the analyst. From big other, to barred other, to desirous other, to enigmatic other, to rejected other. This is the five-part sequence Lacan invited audiences to accept in the 1960s, from Seminar 11 right up to Seminar 17. Analysis was dictated by the position of the analyst, from subject supposed to know, big other, to piece of shit, namely rejected other. And the five-part sequence that we've traced is this fall of the analyst, from the position of the big other with all the answers, you're the doctor, fix me, to the barred other, the other as lacking, to a desirous other, to an enigmatic other, and finally to the rejected other, that stone to be thrown aside at the end of analysis. Lacan has been on board with this, and so have we. Up to this point in lectures on Lacan, this five-part sequence from big other to barred other to desirous other to enigmatic other to rejected other, this is the sequence we also have developed, but with one crucial addition, this one on the side of the analyzand. And it's also an addition that Lacan sporadically signaled throughout the 1960s. And the words for this are the drive. We have a specific lecture series on the drive, so I ain't going to fuck with it. And it's been a perennial topic in all of our series since our series on Seminar 11. So again, I ain't going to fuck with it. You can go back and review those materials. I'll leave it to you to see which of those dots connect to what it is I'm about to say as we wrap up this two-part series on chapters 11 and 12 in Seminar 19. And that's just what I want to do, wrap it up, but in a way that ends with a risk, a hunch, a wager, really. I don't know what the fuck I'm talking about, but I've got a sense of something here that I want to share with you. I don't think analysis ends when the analyst becomes the reject. Now, it's easy to say, well, of course there's more to it than that. Yeah, but no. The point I want to make is that there's something profoundly more at stake when an analysis ends properly. Analysis doesn't end when the analyst becomes the reject. That might be its penultimate turn. Analysis ends when the analyzand stops enjoying their symptoms and their unconscious, stops enjoying their own associations, interpretations, and dialectizations of their own symptoms and unconscious. 
abandoning what is increasingly becoming clear to me at least, this false hope of self-knowledge. This is the end of analysis. When we stop enjoying dialectizations of symptom and unconscious. Now, like I said, I don't know what I'm talking about here. And when I don't know what I'm talking about, I tend to go to a few people, one of whom is Colette Soler. She has a great way of putting this. She says, the end of analysis is the end of the joys of deciphering. It's a terrific statement on what this end of analysis would be. Now, this doesn't mean that we stop associating and interpreting and doing the work of self-analysis. It means we stop enjoying the knowledge and the meaning and the insights produced by this work, or at least that this enjoyment begins to recede like a tide on its way out, calling our attention from the broken bits of the mast up on the beach back out to the unfathomable sea that coughed it up. Let me try and be clear. The end of what Soler calls enjoyed meaning at the level of symptoms dialectized with truths in service to self-knowledge it doesn't mean the end of all enjoyment. That's not what I'm saying here. It just means that the joys of deciphering, so characteristic of somebody who's really into their analysis, these joys give way to others, other enjoyments, enjoyments that elude the phallic enjoyment that so many analyzants get locked into when properly hystericized and yet without ever negating this type of enjoyment. That's an important part here. At the end of analysis, hear me, some but not all of our jouissance is governed by the phallic function. And this is that fourth stage that puts us right on the verge of the something else beyond the phallic function, where being and having can have their place but not take over. What then is this other jouissance? And what becomes of symptoms and unconscious truths when we pursue it? Again, I like Colette Soler on this point. And again, especially in light of what we know about the drive. At the end of analysis, symptoms disconnect from specific individual unconscious truths. They no longer carry any singular, specific, monadological, individual meaning. In other words, symptoms become generic. You don't stop having symptoms. What you realize is that they ain't got shit to do with you and your personal individual past instead of pointing to our own specific history of castration, symptoms at the end of analysis come to index what Soler calls the generic illness of sex. Symptoms become generic. These are less statements of unconscious truth than pronouncements of the real, of what Soler calls the real unconscious if you follow that argument. And this shift, I would like to conclude by suggesting, allows us to introduce a crucial, if only tentative at present, distinction between the unconscious and the real. You know that they are distinct. Up to this point, they have just been in cahoots with each other. The sexual, the impossible, the real, and the unconscious, all squished up together. Ain't a bad way to think. But at this point, I think we can start introducing some finer distinctions. They've always been there, but for purposes of clarity and coherence, we've allowed them to just hang out. Here, it might be worth tracing a specific distinction. And here it is. At the end of analysis, we're no longer dealing with the unconscious truths that are our own, pertaining to our own specific barred subjectivity. 
Instead, I think we might be dealing with the unmarked, unspecified, anomalous, and utterly real unconscious corporality that we, in fact, are. Of anomalous, and I'd even say anonymous life, in the midst, yet also regardless, of enjoyed meaning. And isn't this precisely how we've defined the drive? You bet your ass it is. All right, I'll see you next time.